In this review of the week's news, the biggest Māori festival hits Christchurch's Hagley Park. It's all go for Lydia Ko at Clearwater. And what would you give up for charity? This is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. Thousands of performers will be in Christchurch this weekend to celebrate the Te Matatini Festival. It's the first time the national event has come to the city since 1972. Taking Kapa Haka to an Australasian level. Today marked the first day of performances by top Kapa Haka teams from New Zealand and Australia. Oh, it's awesome bro, been waiting for bloody years for this. 45 teams have been selected from 13 regional festivals. Now it's their turn to take the centre stage for the Team Matatini National Kapahaka Festival. Over the next four days they're going to compete very, very hard to find out who is the best of the best for the next two years. This week more than 30,000 people will turn out to watch the performers in action. This is the elite of Kapahaka performance. Um, you can't get any better than this. Supporters were out in droves today to cheer on their whanau. Oh bro, it's like the Olympics for Māori bro. It's my first matatini and we heard it was in, in Ototahi so we thought right, let's get on our walker and come down here. So where have you come from? Oh just from Blen. It's really awesome, it's a good turnout today and a beautiful day. This is massive being amongst all our own bro and the support of Moon One Last bro, this is massive. Amongst the crowd, a few performers in training. The teams have been practising for the last eight months, all for this moment. And they're impressing the crowd. It's just, it's really important um, to bring back our Māori culture, especially here in Naitahu as well. It's pretty important to keep this sort of thing going. It reunites a lot of people too. People get to meet new whānau that they've never met before, so it's, it's awesome day. It's just about celebrating it, eh, bro? Yeah, I reckon. It's alive and well. This kapahaka inspiring future generations. I think everyone's sort of losing it, especially in uh, the South Island and Christchurch, so I think that's why it's pretty cool it's happening here. They can maintain their cultural identity and also maintain their customs and traditions that we do. This is the first one I've been to, so it's quite exciting. Oh, yeah, I've was, I was been excited for it for the last week. The performances are a powerful watch, capturing the attention of the thousands of spectators, including some people who are new to the Māori culture. I love the musicality of it, but I also love the, the visual, all of, all of the different movements and things that they're doing. Yvonne is taking night classes to learn Te Reo Māori. Matatini is right up her alley. Broaden my horizons a little bit. I lived in, uh, live here in Aotearoa, so it's uh, important, I think, to learn a little bit of um, our biculturalism. The festival runs until Sunday, and thousands of Cantabrians are expected to turn out to watch, celebrating the Māori culture as one. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. There's more evidence of progress in the CBD, and this time the focus is at CPIT. A $16 million building has been completed at the Polytech, and there's still more to come. These students are testing their new volleyball court ahead of the opening of this tertiary provider's new science and wellbeing facility. The nearly $16 million project is just stage one of the CPIT master plan, with Te Whareoro being officially opened by Prime Minister John Key at the Madras Street campus. And Christchurch Polytech's chief executive says it's a major step forward for the institute. Well, I think after the earthquake, CPIT spent a lot of time uh, rebuilding its student numbers and maintaining our quality educational delivery. Uh, but this new facility is really the start of a new era for us. It's a, a modern facility. Uh, it's something that the community can engage with, uh, and, and it'll uh, it'll enhance our teaching and learning. The state-of-the-art learning hub incorporates students studying applied science, sport, and recreation plus work school programs. But Giles says it's more than just learning going on in this building. There's also our health centre, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, so our students have access to healthcare on campus. So there's recreational facilities for students. The ball court can also be used as a, a function hall and can seat up to 800 people uh, as a function. So it'll have a lot of purposes, uh, both for our students and for the community at large. Angie says since the quakes, student numbers have been positive. 
we lost a number of students, uh, but we did manage to rebuild fairly quickly. So our student numbers last year were actually higher than they'd ever been. So we're well and truly recovered from, from the quake in terms of student numbers. And now we're taking the opportunity to uh, grow some more, but also to improve what we do. CPIT has committed funding for three new buildings at the Madras Street campus, coming in at a price tag of $120 million. While the government has chipped in across town, putting in $19 million towards the Polytech's trade site. And although no buildings were lost shortly after the quake, Giles believes they've made the right decision to rebuild. Our buildings came through structurally by and large pretty well. Uh, we, we only had three buildings that what you'd say were structurally compromised. Uh, having said that, we had a lot of damage and in some instances, rather than repair and end up with repaired old buildings, we've chosen to invest rather in new facilities. And usually a red button would call for danger, but instead it was a sign of the building marked open for learning. The Prime Minister was welcomed in to have a look around at this modern learning environment, but this is just the start, with Giles saying they're on track for the new major project known as Stage 2. We've already started on the landworks for it along Morehouse Avenue. We're building a new engineering and architectural studies building because we think that's very relevant to Christchurch this point in time. And over the next eight or so years, we'll actually either rebuild or refurbish every facility on both this campus and on the Sullivan Avenue campus. It sounds like a lot of work, but it's looking bright for education in Canterbury. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Prime Minister John Key was in town this week. He turned up at his former school at Burnside to make a presentation, but it was the war on ISIS which took centre stage. Here's Marcus Gibbs. A lone protester outside Burnside High School's auditorium. I'd really rather not say a lot. Science teacher Jeff Knight silently protesting against the New Zealand government's plans to send troops to Iraq. I'm opposed. How long have you been opposing the idea of the war? Come on guys, I'm not that interesting. The protester refused to comment further on the matter, as did the school's principal, Phil Holstein, who declined an interview and didn't respond to an email requesting a statement from the school. However, Jeff Knight made his position clear on a day when the Prime Minister was due to visit the school. He's against New Zealand sending troops to Iraq to train 16 Iraqi soldiers at Camp Taj near Baghdad. Later at the PM's press conference, again the attention turned to the war with news that Australia is now stepping in. Well, we welcome the news that Australia is sending 300 people to work alongside the 106 New Zealand will be sending. It's very important that uh, there's a, a critical mass to allow us to do the job properly of training uh, those Iraqi forces. This brings the total number of Australian troops based in Iraq to around 900, while New Zealand plans to send 143 soldiers. Australia um, are great partners, they know what they're doing. Uh, they too will be sending, as I understand it, force protection people, so that's an added level of support for our people, and they'd really be our preferred and best partners. The Prime Minister has brushed away rumours that a partnership of Australian and New Zealand troops would be called ANZACs. He says the Australian troops may stay longer and are likely to have a different mandate than the New Zealand soldiers. Specific mandate, and it reflects what we've always said. We have independent foreign policy, we make our own decisions on what we think is best for New Zealand. The announcement comes after former Labor leader Phil Goff posted a statement on Facebook condemning the government's decision to send troops to Iraq, despite promising before the election not to do so. He says it was the wrong decision for the wrong reasons to send the troops. He describes the move as a high-risk deployment, which could subject soldiers to rocket and mortar attacks and road mines. He even suggests some of the trainees could turn their guns on their trainers. He says New Zealand should instead use its position on the United Nations Security Council to demand effective action to stop money, weaponry and personnel going to ISIS. He also suggests saving the $65 million the government is investing in sending soldiers to Iraq and instead spending it on saving lives and alleviating the suffering of some of the 13 million refugees in the region. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Well, still to come, Lydia Ko comes to town. Welcome back. It's been a hundred years since many Cantabrians went to fight in Gallipoli and a new Remembrance Centre has opened to locals young and old to learn about World War One. 
It may be small in size, but it's home to a big part of New Zealand's history. This museum and research centre is located beside and run by the Ranadale Veterans Care Centre in Christchurch. It showcases Canterbury's involvement throughout the Great War in the 20th century, opening alongside the 100th year anniversary of Anzac troops heading to Gallipoli. And the manager says although it looks at the history of the war, it highlights the beginnings of the care centre. The centre has been set up to honour and to uh, educate the people of Canterbury and Christchurch about um, Canterbury's involvement in World War I in particular, but also about Rannadale's establishment as a result of World War I and, and caring for those uh, soldiers and uh, nurses too who came back from World War I. The Ranadale Centre first opened in 1921 on Papua Nui Road, funded at the time by Canterbury's Red Cross. But 95 years on, many contributors have helped put this exhibit together. It's taken nine months to bring it to fruition, showing the complete history of Canterbury's contribution on a timeline, from the beginning to its last World War I resident veteran at Ranadale who passed away in 1996. And Steve says the reaction to the opening of the museum has been great very positive um, and it's wonderful to see that Canterbury and Christchurch um, citizens and wider Canterbury have really rallied around us and I would have thought no, none else than that. I think that's very much what I expected and, and it's wonderful to see. Now the focus has moved to the future and understanding war in this day and age and Steve believes the idea of battle has changed. When soldiers went and served in World War I and World War II and even Korea they had long periods of inactivity and boredom with intense periods of um, battle. The modern day soldier goes over and has intense periods of uh, contact with the enemy if they know who the enemy is. And um, so the stress levels are immense. He says with more people surviving in missions overseas, there's a growing need for psychological care rather than just physical injuries. However, Steve believes it's been the focus for some time, with the Defence Force working with the issue and says New Zealand needs to support the soldiers. I think one of the things that we need to understand in, as New Zealanders, if we ask uh, New Zealand servicemen and women to serve overseas, we are asking, in effect, a great deal. And if we are asking them to do that, we need to stand by them. And not just for the duration of the conflict, but for the rest of their lives. The commemorative centre was officially opened to the public on Saturday and will see a number of visitors and school students understand what happened to Cantabrians through these dark times. The next step is to display the war in the 21st century, with construction starting in the near future. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Hornby High School has found a novel way to get its students into new business ventures. But just what is MyBiz? Here's more on the story. The expo stands, the business cards and the product plans. This is one team of entrepreneurs hoping to create the next big thing. Everything from finding your keys with a global tracker, a set of headphones playing music at the click of a pen, or maybe scented socks. They're just some of the concepts put forward to judges at Hornby High School as part of a Year 12 extracurricular program. But if you want to go camping in style, this product may be for you. Basically we were inventing a beautiful blanket, that was the name, and it was basically a leisure blanket but it's more upgraded so you can take it outdoors, it's portable and it's battery powered as well. This was the winning item for this year's event, with groups working as a team and aiming to succeed. Think of it like the popular British TV series Dragon's Den. My Biz is it's a program that's sponsored by the Murray Women's Development Corporation and this is our fourth year involvement with it and we have two presenters, Mark and Moana, who are business people in their own rights and they fly down from Auckland each year to run this program. Hornby High is the only school taking up the program in Christchurch. The judging panel including business leaders from Westpac, Fulton Hogan and Labour's Wigram MP Megan Wood. The team's only had three days to come up with the idea and execute the product for judging, with this group of nine students each having a role in the project. But 16-year-old Caleb says taking a leadership role has its toll. It was hard, definitely, you know, making sure everyone's OK and, you know, their position and stuff like that, doing the right thing, especially walking around all the time, you know, making sure everyone's OK, you know, and doing my job as well. So it was, it was hard, but it was definitely a good experience. And Wendy says it's more than just inventing a product. 
the main theme over the three days was communication. So they had to be able to communicate with others, work with people who they wouldn't normally sit beside in a classroom, and come to a agreement right at the start what the product was going to be and work towards that. And they were very stressed out over that last day and a bit. It was pretty stressful. That was the main, you know, the main problem. It was very stressful. Everyone was stressing out. For many people, it could take years to run a business as the top dog, <laughs> but not for Caleb. I just walked in, sat down, and um, they basically said, oh, you're our CEO at the moment. And so I kind of just, you know, stepped up a bit more just made sure everyone was okay and comfortable in their positions and stuff. Many students base their projects around music technology, but Wendy says it's all about expanding the student's mind and being creative. The product that won on the day was one that was quite innovative and definitely has marketable options if the students or someone else wanted to pick that up and take it further they had actually thought outside the square a little bit more about what it could be used for etc. And she says the program is designed for students to take their skills further. We're very um, keen here on employability skills, so personal presentation where they had to present themselves, communication, teamwork was a big one as well as just timeliness, getting things done on time. And Caleb agrees. Definitely, especially with my speech and stuff like that, you know, it's very embarrassing if you muck up and stuff like that, so yeah, it's definitely good to practice now. Caleb says his future career is looking towards joining the army, but would he continue his duties as chief executive? Well, I honestly would, I mean, if they said it's possible, then I definitely would, you know, it's a great experience, so I'd definitely take it to that next level. So you never know, this product might be coming to a store near you. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Thousands turned out last week at Clearwater to get a glimpse of world number one female golfer Lydia Ko, but did she live up to her hype? Warren Head reports. The round got underway today in beautiful weather, quite still, a uh, light breeze coming through, excellent conditions for the, the top players uh, who might score extremely low this weekend. Lydia Ko is the big attraction, she's picking 10 under will do it, and she has some experience having played here many times in the past. With her, of course, is a contingent of young players, so she's not going to have it all her own way. But the New Zealand TAB today was offering only $1.80 against the field for Lydia. So that's where the attraction is. And from late morning, the car parks have been filling up. The galleries have been coming in to see this new superstar of golf around the world, the number one, Lydia Ko. With Lydia Ko today were two young stars of the game. Charlie Hull, an 18-year-old from the UK, ranked 34th in the world. Just one win, but already the European Tour Rookie of the Year. This lass represented Europe in the Solheim Cup at the age of only 17. With Lydia Ko today on the first tee was Sue O, oh, an 18-year-old from Australia, ranked 136th in the world. One win already, the Ladies Masters this month and a former world number one amateur. And Lydia Ko herself, the world ranked number one. 17 years of age, nine wins up already, 34 top 10 finishes. The attention was all on Lydia today, and why not? The girl can hit a ball, she really can putt these days, and she looked really good as she set underway for the first round here at Clearwater, and she'll be teeing up again tomorrow morning at 8.24 a.m. So out of bed early, folks, out of bed early, and on to Clearwater if you want to catch that Saturday round and watch this new superstar in the making. I'm Warren Head at Clearwater at the Women's Open. Well, still to come, Canterbury University students give up things for charity. Welcome back. What would you give up for charity? Canterbury University students are giving up beds and even their own reflections. Here's more. Giving something up for charity. That's the challenge for around 100 Canterbury University students over the next two weeks. To sacrifice something they'll take for granted every day. So the idea is it's an alternative and creative way for individuals and businesses to fundraise for local charities that they care about. It's been three months in the making, using an innovator scholarship to create the social enterprise of two weeks without. 
The money raised from the event will go to chosen charities including Husky Rescue, White Elephant Trust and Help for the Homeless. So everyone is doing all these crazy and like vast range of things to go without. So some teams are going two weeks without regular walking, two weeks without beds, two weeks without hot water. Some of the other challenges include not having meat for a fortnight or not using any cutlery, but then some go a step beyond. So that means like no selfies, no looking at yourself in the mirror, no looking at yourself through a glass door or a glass window, walking past a car, you're not allowed to look at yourself. Um, it's sort of like cutting out all narcissism. Uh, but the idea hard. is proving to be difficult. So one of the hardest things is just when you're walking past shop windows and whatnot, and you can sort of see in your peripheral vision that you've got a little bit of yourself over there yeah. and just looking out into the traffic and you walk into people can be a bit of a hazard <laughs> sometimes, I suppose. And Bridget says it's proven to be so popular it's hard to keep up with all the different challenges. It's really cool, it's really good. I mean, like, I can't, I've, like, I've lost track of how many awesome ideas that these guys have come up with and so it's super exciting. And I mean, this is just, it was sort of like our first challenge that we've created and it's just to kickstart things off. So we're going to see where it goes. But with any event like this, the question is, what will they get out of it? We also want the challenge goers to get something out of it too. So we, whether it's um, something that they push themselves with or even it could be like a, a health benefit, like two weeks without sugar or two weeks without coffee or um, two weeks without um, driving the car, that sort of thing. So we want to create a, um, a movement where people are able to come up with these cool, flexible, creative challenges while also do good. She hopes other businesses around the city will jump on board with the challenge. Ideally we want want the two weeks without to sort of facilitate with businesses so businesses would be able to get involved in two weeks without and they can come up with an idea to go without and they could have it within their firm or something like that and it's a really good way to um, create healthy competition and to boost team bond. But she also says the idea could spread further. We really want to see this going nationwide so it's one of those things where um, it's just it's a, an alternative way for businesses um, to do their part in the community. And so this is, um, so yeah, we'd like to see it nationwide and yeah, I mean the sky's the limit but we're going to see how it all goes. So the countdown's on, all for a good cause. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Well if the Christchurch City Council has its way, rates will be rising to more than 33% over the next four years. Here's Marcus Gibbs. Christchurch's pensioners have been left on edge following a proposal from Christchurch City Councillors to increase rates by more than 25% over the next three years. It's pretty steep. Because we are retired, it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it'll be a bit of a blow. It's more than a quarter of what they're paying now, which gives you a realistic idea of what it actually is. And I think anybody that's on a fixed income is going to find that difficult. The City Council has a huge financial challenge and needs to fill a gaping $1.2 billion financial hole. One proposal is to increase rates by 8.5% in 2016, 17 and 2018. Following this, rates would be more than 25% higher than they are today. That means the average rates bill will increase to just over $50 a week in three years time. That's $11 more expensive than now or $572 extra a year, making the average Christchurch yearly rates bill $2,600. For a family on a decent income that might not be a problem, but the city's pensioners will be feeling the pinch. If you're living alone and receive about $360 a week, then a 26% increase in your rates is going to matter. Even if they don't know where the money will come from just yet, retired ratepayers were understanding about why the council needed to increase their rates when CTV spoke to them today. Which way do you go? The council needs some money. We'd like to see them drop some of the big items and try and look after people a bit more, but it's a very tricky one. Age Concern Canterbury is worried their vulnerable Christchurch members may struggle if the rates do increase. Already they've received several calls from worried members on the matter who are concerned they won't be able to afford the new rate hike. So what's going to go? Is it going to be the quality of the food they buy? Is it going to be the amount they go to the doctor? Um, is it going to be the amount they, they heat their home in the winter? Age Concern Canterbury wants the council to allow rebates for its most vulnerable members. Yeah, I think we do need subsidies. Um, 
for older people in these situations when they're suffering hardship. It won't impact on all people, all older people, but there are going to be many who, who find it very difficult and I think there needs to be a system in place to help those people. Aged Concern plans to meet with the council to discuss the matter further. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. And that is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. Have a great weekend. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.